you've had a birthday or an anniversary, brother, we want to sing to you. Looky here. Looky here. How many years, Ruiz? 59. What do you know? Brother, brother. Daryl. Who's that? Oh, yes, yeah, she's eight. I uh, better not say. I was going to tell you how old she was. <laughs> Amen. Arnold. Arnold Shirley. And Linda had a birthday, too, by the way. <laughs> Brother Jim and Barb. Gary got a birthday. Bless you, brother. Well, this is great. We've had a good day. This is a, a good time. Sing the birthday. Anybody else? This would be a good time to celebrate. Brother, here we go. <laughs> Bill and Helen, bless their hearts. Are we, are we waiting on you, Denise? Is this an anniversary, you say? And, okay, Troy's in. All right, this is, this is a banner day. All right, let's sing to these. Happy birthday, and then we'll do the anniversary. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Anniversaries. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary. God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Amen. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Good to see all of you. If you're here for the first time, if you've never uh, been with us before and you're visiting, we want to welcome you and we have a visitor's gift bag to give to you. So if you would just hold up your hand if you're visiting for the very first time, our ushers have a gift bag for you. We'd love for you to fill out a visitor's card as well and put that in the offering. Look around, help me out. If there are any visiting for the very first time, any that you see. All right, looks like we're all home folks today. How many of you happy to have Ronald back up here today? Amen. Good to have Ron and Patty and the crew back. And, no, hey, nothing against Kevin Pope. I saw him make that fay. We, 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 love, we love Ron. Appreciate him. Um, but good to see all of you. Good to see Maria Martin here. She was in the hospital, and she's back today. Thank the Lord for that. I want to remember uh, Jamie Parrish's daughter is, is still in need of prayer today. So let's remember uh, her today as well. All right, let's get a songbook. And let's stand together, and Ron's going to lead us in a number this morning. Who led singing last Sunday night? Will, Will yes. It was you, wasn't it? He's the backup. I was thinking that you that we, we saw it on the, whatever you see that on the face. This is my idea of the Facebook here. He's like this. <laughs> Page 184. God bless you. We love you. Uh, I, I think how good God's been to us, and Rod's taught today about how our, our, our people love one another. And the old Bill Hamilton, every once in a while, I reckon, I don't know if he's here or not, but anyhow, he'll tell us, every, he'll say, if I haven't told you lately, sure do love you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Page 184. Glad for the spirit. <laughs> All right, help me out. Sing it now. I'm rejoicing night and day.
ushers to come and uh, we'll take this morning's tithes and offerings. And what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand, leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Might as well sing the first verse. There is coming a day when the heart aches shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eyes. All is peace forever. Another, and I thought, uh, even this this past week, um, Rocky and Kathy Stanley stayed at a, a, a log cabin place in North Carolina, and they said, "Well, we'll send you some money to your favorite charity." They said, "You send it to our church," and we got a check this week from uh, a log cabin place. People would never because our people chose to give the money yeah. to the church, yeah. and uh, that that's the kind of people we have here. And I said that to say this: I want all of you to stay at that log cabin place in North Carolina. <laughs> And you tell them, no, we love our people. Thank God for our people and the love and the, and the, the sharing that you give. We want to remember, I saw Sister Connie back. Let's remember Paul, Sinquimani. He's been sick as well. Let's lift him up in prayer today as well. Brother Tom, would you pray for us this morning?
Well, my mama told a story from the Bible long ago about Shadrach, Meshach, and all of Bendigo. How the wicked king commanded they be thrown into a flame because they would not bow and then deny their father's name. My mama said the king stood high upon the balcony so tall. When he looked in, he was shot by all the things he saw. Well, he thought that he would find the mine dead upon the ground. But instead of three, counted four, a walking all around. Then I said, Mama, wait a minute, there's something I must know. Well, if three went in and three came out, then where'd the fourth man go? And I never will forget, my mama danced across the floor. These are the words I heard her say as he shouted through the door. He's still in the fire and he's walking in the flame. And he'll be there to help you when you call upon his name. And he can still deliver by his almighty power. While here below, still good to know he's still in the fire. He's still in the fire and he's walking in the flame. And he'll be there to help you when you call upon his name. And he can still deliver by his almighty power. While here below, still good to know he's still in the fire. Well, my friends, you may be destined to face life's hottest flame. But I'm glad that I can tell you through the power of his name. Not one flame of fire will harm you. You'll come through it and you'll tell yesterday, today, forever. God is still alive and well. He's still in the fire and he's walking in the flame. And he'll be there to help you when you call upon his name. And he can still deliver by his almighty power. While here below, still good to know he's still in the fire. He's still in the fire and he's walking in the flame. And he'll be there to help you when you call upon his name. And he can still deliver by his almighty power. While here below, still good to know he's still in the fire. Oh, while here below, still good to know he's still in the I'm not smiling at y'all till you smile at us. <laughs> and that don't count right there. All right? No, I'm just kidding. Good to be here. I'm trying to figure out what, uh, what's going on up here. I think what it is, we sound so bad, it won't even let us hear ourselves is what it is. So <laughs> we'll do what we can do. Key of F. Yeah, there we go. Got something there. Yeah. The old apostle under house arrest began to rise. A message on behalf of one who surely deserved to die. Onesimus had stolen from his Lord and run away. But Paul and him to Jesus said, Now had come the day that he would return to Philemon's house and rise. Wrong he had done. So in letter and head, he was told by God's man, It's time to go now, my son. So with trembling fear, the journey of Onesimus began. He knew the faith that he deserved for the wrong he had done to this man. At last, he arrived. Stood before the one whose mercy he pled. He fell to his knees and offered the letter, hoping that it would be read. Finally, 
He's profitable now to me. He's met the blessed Savior. He's not the man he used to be. And all that he owes to you and your house, regardless of the amount, I promise today. devil's hell I stood before the king of glory guilty of the crimes that old Satan had reminded God I committed so many times oh but the one who sat at God's right hand stood up and he made this decree and then from his lips the sweetest request it was made in behalf of me i know that he's sinful and often fails and i know he's unworthy to live but jesus said oh my father on my behalf i'm asking you to forgive receive him into your house today for you work at Calvary. His debt was all paid that wonderful day when he knelt in the blood flowing found. So take all the wrong that he has done and put that on my account. You can take all the wrong that he has done. I'm glad Jesus said put I tell you, Paul knew something about uh, what well, the Bible talks about God imputing his righteousness to us. And uh, that's a fancy word for saying God takes our unrighteousness and gives us his righteousness. And uh, that's a pretty good deal for the Lord to offer us that. And so we're thankful for his, his gift of salvation. It's the hope that we have. And uh, in a world that's uh, putting more and more pressure on Christians to conform. Uh, God, give us the boldness to still stand for you and stand for what's right. Amen? Amen. See. Look at her face So weary and broken As she weeps for her virgin-born son He's now slowly dying on a cross at Golgotha and in fear his disciples had run but she was his mother and she loved him so much she decided no matter the cost she She said, I'm gonna stand by the cross. I'm Lord, I will I'll stand, stand by, by the cross of the one who is dying for me. And I'll stand so that he knows that I'm truly grateful for the pride. 
grown accustomed to a lack of praise And I'm afraid we think that it's so close to be this way Oh, but I'm here to tell you I believe I know that's not how it has to be Cause when you think of all that the Lord has done for you and me I believe this ought to be what happens in this place Chapter 16, if you have your Bibles. Yes, yes, go ahead, John. Amen. Yes, surely. Amen. Amen. Good to have Shirley here. Miss Connie. Miss Connie. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. God was good. Luke chapter 16, stand with us. Wish I could preach something else this morning, but this is what the Lord left us. We're going to share it with you. You pray for me. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. The Bible says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple in fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. Yep. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. Seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. 
But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Mm -hmm. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let him them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Mm -hmm. And he said unto him, If they not hear not Moses and the prophets... Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the spirit that we felt. And I pray this morning, uh, Lord, that the words you will have me say will will penetrate hearts uh, of those who may be here that are unsaved. Uh, Maybe those who are watching that are are unsaved. Uh, I know there are many here that have family members that are unsaved. They're lost. They're away from the Lord. God, I pray that your spirit would move on hearts and speak to hearts as only you can. Be with us for a few moments, we pray, and have your way in every heart and life. In Jesus' name, amen. I read a poem this week entitled, Five Minutes After I Die. And it says this, it says, Loved ones will weep o'er my silent face. Dear ones will clasp me in sad embrace. Shadows and darkness will fill the place five minutes after I die. Faces that sorrow I will not see. Voices that murmur will not reach me. But where, oh where, will my soul be five minutes after I die? Mated forever with my chosen prong, long as eternity, oh so long. Then woe is me if my soul be wrong. Five minutes after I die. Jesus Christ in this story took a snapshot of the other side of the grave. And he gives us a picture of the first five minutes after death. He pulls back the curtains of eternity and he gives us a look at this unseen world. And he shows us the immediate fate of two men who died. One who died with God and one who died without God. And if you're here this morning, you're going to die one way or the other. One of you are going to die with God or you're going to die without God. Now, there are some people who believe that this is a a parable. Uh, But I believe what we have here is a true story. This is an actual event. I'll tell you why. First of all, Jesus does not introduce it as a parable. Furthermore, he does something he never does in any other parable. He mentions specific names. In other parables, names were never mentioned. But here we have two historical figures for certain, named Abraham and Moses, and then a man by the name of Lazarus. Now understand, this is not the same Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead, which to me also proves this to be a true story, because if Jesus was making it up, why use a a man's name that other people might know and get confused? I believe this was an actual true-to-life account of what happened to two different men five minutes after they died. Now the only thing these two men had in common was the fact that God made both of them. Proverbs 22 verse 2 says, The rich and poor meet together and the Lord is the maker of them all. But other than that, they were as different as night and day. Uh, They were different in their position. One was a prince, the other was a, a pauper. They were different in their possessions. One was a a billionaire. Others considered the other as a a bum. They they were different in their passions. One loved gold and the other loved God. And understand, it was that difference that made all the difference in this story. So from this true story, you're going to see there was a great division between these two men. Actually, there were three divisions. And I want to share those three divisions with you this morning between the rich man and and the beggar. First of all, I want you to notice they were divided by a decision. 
Now understand, on the outside, the difference between these two men was obvious. One man was rich. The Bible says he was dressed in purple, which was the color of royalty. He wore fine linen for his undergarments, which in that day was among the most expensive fabric money could buy. Moreover, we're told in verse 19 that he fared sumptuously. That word, those words literally means that he lived it up. It refers specifically to how well this man ate every single day. He lived in luxury. He had everything money could buy. But then on the other side, there's Lazarus. There's a few things we know about him. He's poor. Verse 20 and 21 says he is a cripple. He had nothing to eat. It seemed like sores and ulcers were, were eating at him. And he had no money for food and no money for medicine or for doctors. And he was simply as poor as the other man was rich. But understand, that was not the greatest difference between these two men. The major difference between these two men was not that one was rich and the other was poor. Don't get the idea that one man went to hell because he was rich and the other one went to heaven because he was poor. Some of the greatest and godliest men in our Bible were rich. Job was the John D. Rockefeller of his day. Joseph was prime minister of Egypt, second in command. David and Solomon were two of the richest rulers who ever lived, but they all had a deep love for God. The difference between these two men was not what they owned, but what owned them. So I want you to understand that if this rich man had given everything he owned to Lazarus, that alone would not have gotten him into heaven. Here was the difference. You see, the rich man had everything except God, and he was satisfied with that. The poor man had nothing but God. And he was saved. You know what the name Lazarus means? It literally means God is my helper or in God I trust. And the Lord Jesus leaves no doubt that Lazarus was indeed a saved man. We're told in verse 22 that when he died, he was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. But on the other side, it's also very obvious that the rich man was lost. And here's the start. He, he, He knew why. He was lost. He asked Abraham later in this story, in verse number 30, to let Lazarus go and preach to his brothers. And he says this, so that they will repent. He had never repented. He had never placed his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he knew it. Howard Hendricks put it best. He said the, the rich man was in hell, not because he did not give bread to Lazarus, but rather because he had never accepted the bread of life in his own heart. These two men were divided by a decision. One decided to accept the Lord, and the other decided not to. In church, it's that decision that makes all the difference, both in this life and the life to come. So the first division we see between the rich man and Lazarus, they were divided by a decision. Second of all, we see they were divided by death. It's interesting to me to see how the Lord Jesus described the moment of death for both of these men. In verse 22, he said that when the beggar died, he was carried. But when the rich man died, he was buried. And that's exactly exactly here where we see the, the great divide. You see, if we're honest this morning, you can't always tell on this earth who belongs to God and who does not. You really can't tell who is saved and who is lost. Jesus told a parable about this one time called the wheat and the tares. And he said that in this world, there will be people like wheat. And right along growing up with them, there will be people who are like tares. They they look very much alike because a tare is basically a counterfeit kernel of wheat. And what they do, they grow up together. And Jesus said you can't really tell them one from another. That is until it's harvest time. You know what you find? The wheat will be bowing to its maker, the creator, The tear is still standing up proud and straight, not bowing over. And the truth of the matter is there are some people in this world who are lost, who on the outside they appear to be saved because they they live a good moral life and they they say the right words and they, they, they do the right part. And yet there are people in this world who are saved, who may at times 
appear to be lost. But the real test of whether or not a person is saved comes at your death. You know, high up in the Rockies, there lives what we call the, the Great Divide. That is where the mountains reach their highest peaks. And they say when a drop of water falls on the Continental Divide, if it falls just a little to one side of the divide, that drop of water will continue to go and flow on toward the west until it goes out into the Pacific Ocean. But if that drop of water falls and turns to the other side of the Continental Divide, it'll continue to flow until it reaches the Mississippi Valley. And it'll go out into the Mississippi River, down into the Gulf of Mexico, and out into the Atlantic Ocean. Now think of this. Both of those drops, they, they, they look alike. And they start almost exactly in the same place. But in the end, they actually wind up oceans apart. And that's exactly the way it is with people today. People look alike. We have the same backgrounds. We have the same opportunities. We have the same abilities. Yet at death, we end up worlds apart because of a prior decision and a prior choice. Now when Lazarus died, we're told he was carried by angels. And it says something interesting. It says, to Abraham's bosom. And that's an interesting Old Testament phrase because... Abraham's bosom was, was used to, for Jewish people to describe paradise, the place where God's people went after death. And because Abraham was the father of the Hebrew nation, it was only natural for Abraham himself to greet the faithful children of God after they died. Beyond that, it was the custom of the day for the most honored and respected guest at a feast to sit close to the host. And the best position would be that of leaning back on the, the bosom of the host. You remember John the Beloved at the Last Supper? He's leaning upon the bosom of, of Jesus. So that is where we find Lazarus. He was carried. And at his death, Jesus points out, he was carried to the most honored place that you could be. Right in the very heart of paradise. But then you go on the other side. And Jesus tells us the rich man was simply buried. Again, there's no question he had a magnificent funeral. You know, when rich people of that day died, they would actually hire mourners to cry over their coffin. They would hire great speakers to come and give flowery eulogies at their graveside. They would pay them to brag on their achievements and tell others how great they are. Calvin may remember our first time to Israel. We were on the Mount of Olives we're on that slope where all those tombs are, where many believe that Jesus pointed and called the, the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. And, and we're there. One whole side of the Mount of Olives is, is nothing but tombs. And we're there, and Charlie Dyer is speaking. And if you look on the graves in Israel, they don't bring them flowers. They bring them rocks. How would you like to get a rock at your funeral? But that's how they do it. It's a rocky, arid climate. And they bring rocks, and they, they set those rocks all over these graves. And, and while we're there and listening to him teach... All of a sudden, this man comes driving down the Mount of Olives in a Mercedes Benz. And he gets out of that Mercedes, and he's all dressed up, all nice and fine. And he walks past us over to a couple off in the distance who were standing by a grave. And he walks up to them, says a few words, and he pulls out this booklet. And he starts chanting and rocking back and forth, mourning out loud. No tears are falling down his face. And he, he's pretending to weep and cry out. And he does this for about five or ten minutes. And, and after he's done, he closes his book, puts it in his pocket. They shake hands and they hand him a check and he leaves. <laughs> I promise you that happened to this rich man. Great things were said about him. Magnificent funeral. We know the bodies of rich people, they would be embalmed with the most expensive spices that money could buy and wrapped in the finest linen and would be placed in the costliest of graves. But the bottom line is, the Bible simply says this, he died and was buried. And friend, you may not think being saved is very important and you may not think there's really all that much difference between being lost and being saved, but at death, I promise you, you will see a difference. When Voltaire, the atheist, lay down to die, his last words he cried out were these. He said, I am abandoned by God and man. And he died and went out into eternity. 
When Thomas Paine, the famous agnostic and infel, died, his last words were, What a fool I've been! God, help me, for I cannot bear this burden alone. And he died and went out into eternity. But compare that to when death came to the great evangelist D.L. Moody. This is what he said on his deathbed. He said, Earth is receding. Heaven is descending. God is calling. And I am going home. And then he said this in past. Is this death? Why, it's not so bad. It's glorious. For this is my coronation day. And he died. Without a question, death is the great divider between all men. And I ask you this morning, which side will you be on when death comes for you? These men were divided by a decision and they were divided by death. And last of all, this morning, they were divided by destiny. For after these men died, we read that one went to be eternally glorified while the other went to be eternally horrified. One entered into the joy of the Lord while the other entered into the judgment of the Lord. Today, one is enjoying the happiness of heaven while the other is still today enduring the horrors of hell. We're told specifically in verse 25 that Lazarus was comforted. Can't you see Lazarus five minutes after he died? He was hungry before, wasn't he? Hungry no more. He's feasting at the table of the Lord. He was sick before, sick no more, permanently healed by the great physician. He was poor before, poor no more, walking on streets of gold, homeless no more, living in a mansion, alone no more, standing with a friend who sticks closer than a brother. But on the other side, the rich man. That was a whole other story. Verse 23 describes his immediate fate after death. It says, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Now, church, I want want you to look at this because here we have one of the most detailed descriptions in all the Bible of the unsaved sinner dying and being separated for all eternity from God. Do you know that there's someone dying across this world every three seconds? Some go to heaven, some go to hell. But, But what do we know about hell for sure out of this story? Well, we know, number one, it will be a place of unbearable pain. We are repeatedly told of the torture that this man was in. The Bible, it holds nothing back in its description. In verse 23, we read, he was in torment. In verse 24, he says, I am tormented in this flame. In verse 25, we're told he was tormented. And in verse 28, his new home for all of eternity is described as a place of torment. In fact, every word he utters is a word of agony. In verse 24, we read, Then he cried and said, If you underline your Bible, underline that word cried, because the word cried there literally means to scream in agony. This man was in such agony. In verse 24, look what he says. And he cried. He screams in agony and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. How desperate does this man sound? You know how little water you can get from the tip of your finger? And yet he's crying out, begging for even less than a drop of water. And you know the sad truth is he didn't get it then. And 2,000 years later, he still not received that drop of water. Now understand, there are the liberals out there. I told you this Wednesday night, liberals are leeches. People come in with morals and they build things and liberals come in and tear it down. The liberal will say this. The flame that's in that passage of scripture is not really fire. Well, who told you that? Where are you getting your information from? And they'll say this. Hell is not a literal place of fire. Well, if you take the word of God as it says, the man says, I am being tormented in this flame. But listen, let's take it out. Let's say there were no flames. 
take the flames completely out, I want you to imagine eternity with no water. Imagine eternity separated from God. Imagine eternity with the devil and his demons. Imagine eternity where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. You can take the flames out if you want. They're there. But sadly enough, this man is still tormented and tortured, feeling pain and agony and misery for the rest of his life. Hell is a place where there's no water for the fire and no medicine for the pain and no comfort for the suffering. It will be a place of unbearable pain. Let me show you a second thing hell will be a place of. It will be a place of unanswered prayer. Look what he says in verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. That word pray is a word that literally means to ask a request in prayer. Did you know that some of the most fervent praying in the world is going on right now in hell? But the problem is nothing can ever escape hell, even prayer. And it's a shame this man finally believed in prayer, but... He believed in prayer too late. And notice what he prays. His prayer, it's all wrong. First of all, he's praying to the wrong person. Notice his prayer was to Abraham, not to God. Do you know there's a a group of people who pray to saints every single day? And there are people who pray to characters of the Bible every single day. They're praying to the wrong person. He's also praying in the wrong place. Men and women, listen, the time to pray is now on this side. Get it right on this side. Do it at your seat. Do it at an altar. Don't wait till you're in hell. It's too late. But he was also praying with the wrong purpose. He wanted Lazarus to go and witness to his five brothers. And his thinking was this. He says it in verse 30. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead... They will repent. See what he's saying? If my brothers could see a miracle, if they could see Lazarus come back from the dead, then they would be saved. And I love Abraham's response in verse 31. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets. You know what that is? That's the Old Testament. Moses wrote the first five books. He got the prophets the rest of the way. He says, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, the Old Testament, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. And you know what that tells me? The Bible is enough, folks. I don't need a bunch of entertainment. I don't need people jumping around dancing. I don't need smoke. I don't need lights. I don't need mirrors. All I need is the Word of God. And that will get it done if you are unsaved. Right here. Abraham correctly pointed out, if a person will not believe the word of God, then they will not believe in the works of God and his miracles. I thought here Jesus rose from the dead. Did all the religious leaders come to Christ after that? It was a miracle? No. You know what they did? They lied and they tried to cover it up. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. What did they do? They wanted to kill Jesus and Lazarus. Miracles of itself do not bring people to Christ, but I know a book of the Bible that will bring you to Jesus Christ every day of the week. Salvation will never be found in seeing miracles today. But it will be found in the message, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hell is a place of unanswered prayer. But then notice hell is also a place of unchanged persons. There's something you need to see about this rich man that you may miss it at the first glance. Did any of you notice that as this man is discussing with Abraham that he still hasn't changed? Even though he knew he's in hell because he did not repent, yet in hell he still would not repent. He did not love God when he was on earth, and he still doesn't love God now that he's in hell. Say, so how's that? Well, let me show you. Look at verse 24. He says, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, a sinner. Is that what he says? Have mercy on me for all the wrong that I've done. Is that what he says? No. You know what he says? Have mercy on me and now do something for me. Get me some water. Hey, hey, Abraham, I got an idea. Send Lazarus. Isn't that something? He's still ordering people around. 
He still sees Lazarus as a beggar, his servant. Send Lazarus and let him do me a favor. There are some people who believe that people are in hell crying out for God to save them and repenting of their sins. The Bible doesn't teach that. I mean, we have a true account of a person going there and not one time is he repenting of his sins, feeling sorry for what he's done or knowing what he had lived. Revelation 22, 11 says this, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. I like what John MacArthur says. He says, if a man does not love God on this side of hell, he will not love God on the other side of hell. So hell is a place of unbearable pain and unanswered prayer and a place of unchanged persons. And last of all this morning, hell is a place of utter hopelessness. I mean, think about it, above anything else, hell's a place of hopelessness. Hell is a place where there's no hope. Bernard M. Baruch called hopeless the saddest word in the English language. And I believe that's true. See, we, we don't know in this world what it's like, not like to have, to have any hope. If you're sick, there's always hope you get better and Maybe in the business world, you're always hoping the economy will turn around. Even a condemned man on death row always has a a hope that there could be a pardon or a a stay of execution. But in hell, there's no hope. Maybe you've read the the book, Dante's Inferno. It's a book about the author Dante and his description of, of his journey through hell. And as Dante begins his journey through the entrance door into hell, there above the door walking into hell are are these words inscribed. It says, Ye who enter here, leave all hope behind. And I believe the rich man understood this. Because in our story, church, if you notice, he made two requests. You remember what they were? He requested that Lazarus get him some water. And that Lazarus go back to his brothers. And I thought, what if it were you in hell? What request would you make? I don't know about you, but if it was me, I would be asking, Hey Abraham, is there any way for me to get out of this place? Is there any hope to get out of this terrible place that I am in? But he never asked that because he understood there's no more hope. And then he says one more thing. He says, and don't forget, remember your life while you were on earth. And remember Lazarus' life. And that's one of the saddest pictures that there are people in hell who remember their life on this earth. They remember the time they may have sat in church like you are today. And they remember that the Holy Spirit convicted them And they could have been saved, but they turned and pushed it away. What a terrible thought that you will remember the rest of your life in a tormenting place as hell of all the chances you had to get things right with Christ, and yet you pushed Him away. Now Jesus told this story to illustrate one major truth, and it's this. I'm I'm done. Here's the major truth. You don't have to go to hell. You you don't have to go if you don't want to go. Jesus came to this earth and paid the price just for you. And the choice is up to you. You don't have to go to hell. You can spend eternity in heaven. You say, I made all these mistakes. I'm a sinner. You don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter. Jesus took all those sins on the cross. He paid the price. The choice is up to you now. Do you accept that payment? No one else can make that choice. Only you. An elementary teacher was telling her story about Luke 16, and she asked the kids at the end, at the very end of the story, she said, which one would you rather be, the rich man or the beggar? The little girl raised her hand. She said, well, teacher, I'd like to be the rich man on earth and the beggar in heaven. <laughs> Smart kid, good choice, but that's not how it works, is it? Friend, we have a choice to make before we die. But understand something. You have no more choices after you die. 
Your eternal destiny is determined upon the choice you make on this side of eternity. I'm going to show you a picture. Some of you remember this picture. It was only last week. A week ago, folks. A week ago. We sat at this fundraiser. Mike and Jimmy, and that's, that's Dave McKay. Let me tell you something. He did an outstanding job. He, he really, I mean, he, it flowed. He got money. I'm telling you, an outstanding job. Who would have thought that we're at an event raising money for a family who are fighting for their life, and within four days, that man would be dead and now out in eternity? And I say all that to say this. If we knew when we were going to die, we'd get things right now. We'd get our house in order. We'd be as close to the Lord as we possibly can. But we don't know when we're dying. And so the choice is left up to you. You can take that away. And so I ask you this morning, death is no respecter of persons. None of us would have thought Dave McKay wouldn't have lived to see the following Saturday. None of us. But death is no respecter of persons. It could come to you today. It could come to us this week. I ask you, what choice have you made on this side of eternity? I started this message with a poem, and I only gave you the first half. I'm reading the second half, and I close. It says, oh, what a fool, hard the word but true, passing the Savior with death in view, doing a deed I can never undo five minutes after I die. But thanks be to Jesus for pardon free. He paid my debt on Calvary's tree. Heaven's gates will now open for me five minutes after I die. And then he closes and says, God help you to choose your eternal state. Depends on your choice. You dare not wait. You must choose now. It will be too late. Five minutes after you die. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one's looking around. I ask you this question. Where will you be five minutes after you die? What will you be saying Five minutes after you die? Will it be a place of comfort for you or a, a place of torment for you five minutes after you die? Heads are bowed, Christians are praying. I ask you, sir, I ask you, ma'am, has there ever been a time in your life where you made the choice? to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because if you're going on your good works and the good person you've been, you will go to this eternal hell for all of eternity. Have you ever done that? Have you ever accepted Jesus and His sacrifice on the cross for your sins? Heads are bowed, no one's looking around. Would you be honest today? We're not going to embarrass you. I want to pray for you. You're lost. You've never been saved. And if you're in that condition today, no one's looking. Would you just slip your hand up and put it right back down? I want to pray for you. I'm not going to ask you anything else. Would you, would you slip your hand up? Bless that hand. Any others? I, I'm lost. I'm not a Christian. I'm unsaved. If I were to die in my present state, I would go to this eternal hell separated from God. Any others? I, I'm not a Christian. Would you pray for me? Upstairs or down below, I'm not a Christian. Would you pray for me? Would there be others? Christian, how many of you have loved ones who are lost and headed for this place? Would you just slip your hand up? Yes. Bless all the hands. Maybe you need to step out and come and call their name out in prayer. I guarantee you there was somebody calling your name out in prayer when you were lost. God hears the prayers of his people. Maybe you want to do that today. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you don't sugarcoat it. You tell us what awaits us. You tell us what's coming it's up to us. Help us to make the decision for you. 
we're here today and we are saved and we have loved ones who are unsaved, help us to do our part to try to win those who are lost. We love you. We thank you. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand to sing and you need to step out and come, and you need to pray. Some have already come. The altars are open. Page 81. Just as I 